Hi, good evening everyone. I am so happy to see you all here tonight at the Bali. My name is Sophie Rutefrans and I will be your moderator for tonight. And I'm not only welcoming you to the program of tonight, I'm also welcoming you to the Free Thinkers Festival 2023. And um, this festival is in the honor of Amsterdam being uh, 248 years old. In two years, it will be 250 years. Oh, sorry. <laughs> already made a mistake, perfect. Um, luckily I'm not alone, the mayor of Amsterdam is here to correct me and <laughs> I think if someone has to be corrected, you can be best corrected by the mayor of Amsterdam, of course. Um, we will uh, talk these coming days about uh, uh, queerness, about the image of Amsterdam being the queer capital of the world. We put a question mark behind it because in the coming days we will research this and shed light on the positive sides and also on the things that we may have to still be accomplished. Um, we are here tonight with a great writer, Tori Peters. I am so happy that she's here tonight and we will talk with her and other guests very shortly. But first I would like to give the word to our mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so very much and good evening everybody. Um, it's good to be here at the opening of another uh, edition of the Free Thinkers Festival on the eve of the cities I already mentioned it, 748th anniversary, sorry Sophie. This year's theme is Amsterdam Queer Capital, with a question mark at the end. Answering the question with a clear yes is probably presumptuous, but it's certainly the ideal we cherish. And this evening about trans literature is contributing to this ideal. The Dutch novelist, Connie Palmen, says that we live in an age of trans, and I quote, what once most clearly determined a person's fate, the country and body in which you were born, has gradually lost its gr fatal grip on a human life and has made way for a tempting and yet frightening freedom. The tormenting unfreedom of fate has made way for the ter terrifying freedom of choice. Fate, she says, has become plot. When fate becomes plot, we need fiction writers more than ever. So I warmly welcome Tori Peters and all of you to Amsterdam. And I also welcome the age of trends. But I, I think we're not quite there yet. To truly have an age of trends, we not we need not only the possibility of being of trends, but also the acceptance of trends. This means embracing transgender, transgender people and the whole queer community and standing in solidarity with their struggle for equal rights and complete acceptance by society. But like Connie Palman, I'd also like to advocate the idea of trans as a broader, broader concept. The idea that not everything is fixed, that things can change and will change, and that both unfreedom and freedom can make us anxious. In other words, a true age of trends is filled, or must be filled, with empathy and tolerance. And the empathy and tolerance that great literature can teach us. Frankly, I worry. I worry about the lack of empathy and, and tolerance in the world, but also in this city. People who deviate from mainstream society because they are queer, because of their convictions of backgrounds, still suffer from ongoing discrimination. This is sometimes subtle, sometimes far from subtle. Attempts to educate people about transgender issues, for example, are often met with the hostile, re hostile reaction that this is an ideology being forced on society. And this reaction completely lacks empathy for people who really deserve it. Let me be clear. Transgender people are strong and don't need our pity. 
but they're vulnerable when they become the object of hate and nobody stands up for them. Hate because of who they are. The choices transgender people make to transition, or as in the novel of Tori Peters, to detransition, are choices they make to become who they really are. The queer community, migrants, and other minorities face this kind of hate because they also want to be who they are. Amsterdam is a city made up of minorities. Our city runs on empathy and tolerance. And our city would be ruined, as it has been in the past, by hatred. When I refer to the need for empathy and tolerance, I can't ignore, and I hope you allow me to say a few words, to the situation in Israel and Gaza, and the effect it has on Amsterdam and other cities. The city of Amsterdam has condemned the brutal attack by Hamas uh, ter terrorists. It has called for the attention for the dire situation of the people in Gaza and is contributing humanitarian aid. The Israeli government deserves harsh criticism for violating human rights and international law in Gaza and on the West Bank. But Jewish people here and elsewhere cannot be blamed for the wrongdoings of the Israeli government. They deserve our empathy. They feel vulnerable. They feel vulnerable when fellow citizens refuse to condemn Hamas. Or when they see dog whistles like one Uma, one flag, one army, one solution. And they feel seriously threatened when they hear calls for the destruction of Israel. And they're terrified when they see social media posts praising Hitler and the gas chambers. I stand for the freedom to protest and the freedom of expression. It's almost impossible to stop anonymous social media trolling. But in this city, which didn't prevent the murder of 60,000 Jewish residents 80 years ago, I will and cannot be silent when anti-Semitism rears its ugly head. And I call on everyone who has feelings of solidarity with, with Palestinians, as I think we all do, to also show empathy towards Jewish people. Please make a distinction between the government of Israel and Jewish people. And I call on everyone to look beyond the positions people take in this conflict and see the basic humanity that we all share. A man waving a Palestinian flag is also a son and maybe a loving father or an inspiring teacher. A woman wearing the Star of David around her neck is also a daughter and maybe a caring sister and a life-saving doctor. Their tears, all their tears, both spring from deep, from deeply felt sadness and sorrow. Supporters of the Palestinian cause and members of the Jewish community initiate dialogues and promote mutual understanding in this city. Despite, I think I forgot a page. No, I didn't. And again, supporters of the Palestinian cause and members of the Jewish community initiate dialogue and promote mutual understanding. And despite their sometimes strong disagreements, they are doing everything they can to prevent the conflict from flaring up here in Amsterdam. And we should all support these efforts. We should all to the best of our ability, reach for our empathy and our tolerance. Dear guests, the age of trends as an age of empathy and tolerance hasn't arrived yet, as we see on a daily basis. But together we can bring it a step closer. 
in view of world events, listening to great writers seems like a small step, but it is meaningful. It's very meaningful. Because writers can infect us with hope. So, enjoy the evening, baby. <laughs> Thank you so much, Femke Halsema, for your beautiful words. Um, it is now my time and my honor to introduce to you Tori Peters. Um, she grew up in Chicago, attended art schools, and graduated in comparative literature. She published two novellas in 2016, followed in 2020 by the debut novel De Transition Baby, also in Dutch as De Transitie Baby. Um, and when I read the book a year ago, I could not stop thinking about it. Um, I have given it to at least 10 of my friends. I really enjoyed it, and I could not stop talking about it. It. So I'm more than happy that I can talk an hour about it with the writer herself, Tori Peters. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you to the mayor as well. How did you listen to the speech of the mayor? Um, uh uh, rapt, raptly, I think. Um, you know, I think it's actually, it's, it feels very appropriate um, because I've been, um, I've been touring, I think I toured in like 13 countries with this book. And a lot of times the themes are trans. It's just like, this is trans, this is trans. And, and a lot of the, what I've been um, trying to sort of talk about is, is the ways in which trans, trans themes transcend that, you know, that, that questions of bodily autonomy for, for trans women super easily bleed into questions of abortion in the United States. Um, you know, the f famous uh, trans writers before me, um, like uh, uh, in the author of Butch Stone Blues, was, uh, was a, an activist uh, on Palestinian issues, you know, that, so I think there's a history of, um, of trans writers and trans thought being applicable uh, in other situations. And I think that that's actually the only way that, uh, it's not, I don't wanna say win, that we're gonna win, but like, you know, like this actually matters for everybody. It's not actually a niche issue. And, and so it feels very appropriate that a night of, of trans literature would, would start out with themes that aren't necessarily, you know, specifically trans. Yeah. And she talks about writers giving us hope. Um, do you have writers that give you hope? Yeah, I have a lot. I mean, writers are basically where I find hope. Um, I would say that I, writers saved me, actually. And like, not just like, like uh, you know, obviously like very famous writers saved me, but also, um, you know, I wrote this book in, I started in 2015 and I moved to Brooklyn and I became part of this trans writing scene called Topside Press. And it was, it was literally a book by someone who's now my friend, uh, Imogen Binney's book, Nevada, that I read. And um, I think it, like, yes, it taught me how to write, but I think more importantly, it taught me how to live. And most of the books that I really love are books that are like, yeah, they make me laugh. Yeah, I love those characters. They're great, but they also are, are kind of, like strangely guides for living or, or at least test cases for living. Like yeah. they, might, they might not be my role models, like Reese, I'm not like, that's my role model, everybody should be like Reese, <laughs> definitely don't. But also, um, you know, I think negative role models that you can run into literature and you can actually experience extremes and be like, I, I actually see how this works out in, in literature. That book, Nevada, was about a trans woman that I think was, if anything, a model of how not to be trans or how not to think about trans, which saved me because I think I was thinking about trans in the exact same way that Maria, the protagonist, was thinking about it. And so when I say that book saved me, it was like it, it made me not go down a road that could have been, yeah. um, it wouldn't have been like tragic, but it just would have been disappointing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I heard a lot of people laughing when you mentioned Reese, one of the main characters of your book. Um, can we see a, a few hands of who read the book already? 
Oh, oh that's, that's nice. A lot that's of nice. People, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it feels sometimes it's like nobody raises their hand. <laughs> yes, it's a scary moment. Yeah, no, this is great. Thank you. <laughs> Can be. Um, when you wrote the book, did you expect that it would reach such a global, large audience? I mean, no. The, the flat, flat answer is no. Like, I wanted my friend Morgan to read it, you know? <laughs> um, it's like, if I get Morgan, this is a success, you know? And so there's like, There's like literally jokes in there. I'm like, this one's for Morgan. Like, she'll <laughs> love it. Um, uh, but you know, you find that if Morgan likes a joke, everybody likes a joke. So, um, if anyone knows who Morgan is, that would be really funny for you. Um, she's a, she runs a great uh, podcast on trans history called One from the Vaults. If anyone wants to read it, that anyway, jokes are for Morgan in the book. Yeah. Uh, but no, so I didn't think I'd ever be here. Um, <laughs> You know, in, in, in a certain way, once the book was picked up by Random House, um, you know, they sort of asked me, like, what's the strategy for selling this book? And I told them, um, you know, and, and I think that the first version of it was like this kind of very generic grab bag of queerness. Like, this is a book for readers of Sarah Shulman and also people who paint their fingernails. And like, it everyone. just was, yeah, but it wasn't everyone. It was like a very kind of like, Hallmark card version of queerness that actually doesn't exist, right? Like, you know, there is no kind of like one generic queer thing, which is what I think they they pitched. And I I actually rejected that. I was like, that's not actually how I want to sell this book. And I I said, I want this book to be a trans iteration of a long trajectory of women's literature, which is domestic fiction. You know, how do you make a family? What does it mean to make a family? And I think that, you know, this was Random House, the Penguin Random House, the biggest publisher in the world. And you give them a queer book and they like fumble it and they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And in fact, it was like, look, you guys are the best at the world in this. Like, you know where the readers are. All you have to do is take a trans book and do with it the exact same thing that you would do with any other book. Yeah. And it was weird, like going into these meetings with like, you know, uh, publicists and saying this because they're like you've self-published a book what are you talking about <laughs> but in fact like you know I was surprised they believed me and they executed the strategy along those lines and like sort of I was shocked that that in fact that this thing that I'd said that I be that I believed I didn't really have a test case of it in the world and then the book became a test case of it in the world you know suddenly it was on uh, television in the United States and they were not talking about it I mean they were obviously you know being like these are trans themes yeah. but they weren't like this is a trans book that's gonna weird you out they were like this is a trans book in the tradition of you know um, everything from Mary McCarthy to, to Sex in the City and it's actually not that difficult to grasp yeah your book is about family it's about friendship about being trans um, uh, you already said it about complex relationships that we all encounter, yeah. I think. Um, can you give us some insights into the three main characters? Sure. The, um, the Reese that I talked about, you can think of her as um, sort of like, like flea bag, but trans in that like <laughs> she's like, uh, and in Brooklyn, obviously not London, she's like a mess. She's sleeping with married men and uh, You're just kind of having having not great relationships, and the action of the book kicks off when her ex Ames, who used to be a trans woman named Amy, gets his boss Katrina, a cis woman, pregnant, and then returns to Reese and says, "Would you like to raise the baby together as a kind of triad?" And that obviously sounds convoluted. It's like the first. Eight pages, I think. Yeah, it's like it's just you're not it's just, spoiling anything. Yeah, it's not. That's not a spoiler. Like that's just the setup. You just get in the door with that, and if you can walk in the door, then you know the book just kind of takes off from there. Yeah. So you have you have Reese, a trans woman, Ames, a detransitioned trans woman living as a man, or you know you could Ames's identity is probably the most difficult to define, yeah. and then you have Katrina, who's a, a divorced cis woman, yeah. who's pregnant. You actually dedicated the book to divorced cis women. Right? Yeah, I did. Um, you know, when I, I talk about, I thought a lot about audience when I was first writing this book because, like I said, I wrote it for like probably 12 friends, you know, initially. And I had this, um, I had this idea of, of what it might mean to, to write for an identity, 
You know, I, I, I sometimes when I talk, I, talk, I quote Toni Morrison, and I say that, um, you know, Toni Morrison, she, she, in her Nobel speech, she said she wrote explicitly for black women. And the reason that she, that she did that is that um, she didn't have to explain anything. She didn't have to slow down. And so with, when I was writing for my friends, there was this idea that, you know, if I was writing for my friends, I would never have to stop and be like, actually, here's what hormones are, or like, actually, here's what, I don't know, whatever is. And I could just tell a story and, and, and do it as a flat out, at a flat out sprint, because nobody was like, nobody wants Toni Morrison just like stop and explain some slang. You're like, that's Toni Morrison, just like go, yeah. you know? And, and I hope that it was similar. And so this idea, I had this initial idea of, of writing for an identity group. Um, but as, as I continued to write, I began to think like, well, actually, what does it even mean to write for a trans audience? Like there's not like one way of being trans. There's not like, you know, why people are trans, all sorts of reasons. And certainly from my two novellas, I learned that, you know, there are people who, who don't like my writing, who are trans, and it's like, am I writing for them? You know, yeah. so I, I began to think about affinity, and like, not that I'm writing for identity, but that I'm writing for people who have affinity with my, with my experience. And as I'm writing this, I'm finding that I'm drawn mostly to reading books by divorced women. I'm reading like Rachel Kosk, I'm reading like Elena Ferrante, I'm, I'm reading Sula, I'm reading, um, all these different books, I'm like, why am I constantly going to, to, to divorce women? And I think it's actually that the trajectory of a, of a trans woman, or at least my trans experience, is very similar to the trajectory of a divorced woman, in that you, you live your life thinking it's gonna be a certain way, and then there's a moment of like break or rupture, and you kind of have to start over, and you, you either can get really bitter, which you know I tried out for a while, <laughs> um, <laughs> Or you can invest in old illusions, you know, that like you, the, the, for divorce women, like, oh, that first guy wasn't Prince Charming, but the second guy will be Prince Charming. It's like, no, nope, probably not. Um, and so what you actually have to do is you kind of have to, you know, f face reality in, in a, in, and tell yourself the truth and move forward uh, without bitterness or illusions. Um, and that, so the questions that these books by divorced women were formulating were actually the questions that I, as a trans woman, needed. And so I was like, yes, I find books by trans women that save me, but also, you know, there's chapters in Ferrante where I'm like, this, you could substitute the word trans and have my experience. Um, and yet I found in those books that they, they, the experience of trans women wa wasn't really there, which is not like every book has to, you know, address trans women. But I was a little bit like, there's a conversation that, that can happen here. Yeah, like, it's a starting point. It's a starting point. Like, there's things about gender and ideas about gender in this book that I think lots of cis women, you know, could resonate with. And points of view that come from like a trans lens that would like, that might actually be helpful. Um, like the, the doTERRA essential oils party that's in the book, if you've read it, like that was a room full of cis, cis women who maybe could have like, had something to hear from Reese, you know? Yeah. So I, I kind of dedicated this book because I'm indebted to those divorced women that I read. And also, I'd really love it to be a conversation instead of a kind of like one way. Uh, Street. I inherit yeah. their writing and that's it. Yeah. Okay, we will talk further, but first I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Sel Mirel Wenselaars, curator, writer, and researcher, is going to read something for us, and then she will join us at the table. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi. I flipped through my 2010 agenda. Work assignments, concerts, theatre performances, birthday parties, city trips to Paris and Lisbon, and there is not a single day without something planned. In between, there are six appointments with a psychologist from the gender clinic. And at the end of the year, four days before Christmas, she addresses me sternly that our conversations seem to lead nowhere. <laughs> I'm always on time, obediently fill out the questionnaires, speak openly about my fears and my feelings, 
But once I'm outside again, and on the train back home, I return to my regular life. There's been a little change in appearance. I'm still wearing the same baggy jeans and loose sweater, but my hair has only grown a little bit. So my therapist advises me to take a step back, to have a break. I feel I need to get away, to detach from my surroundings, and on an impulse, I book a flight to New York. And it's not an outing, it's not just a trip. I feel like I need to hurry up and skip the tourist attraction. So in a charity shop, I find a black dress, this one, that completes my outfit. And with makeup on and the red pumps I found at Macy's, the Bijkorf, I go to a cafe, <laughs> a cafe downtown where, according to a quite obscure website, trans women gather. Well, it turns out to be a dingy bar, a meeting place for chasers and their targets. So when a man approaches me at the bar, I excuse myself and rush to the restroom. I'm not here to find somebody outside of myself. And inside the women's restroom, well, it's crowded in front of the mirror. And I'm immediately noticed, greeted with enthusiasm and given a hug by a stranger and complimented. And yes, I feel seen and can finally head home because I know what's necessary and I have no time to waste. So back home, I inform my therapist. I'm prepared to begin my transition. Decision-making was never my strongest suit. So a few months later, prior to commencing the hormone therapy, I make my way to the Bali in Amsterdam. Still full of doubt. I take the train from Antwerp to Amsterdam and with a suitcase full of clothes that I don't dare wearing at home, but maybe I will dare. And I'm on my way to the first edition of Transcreen, the Amsterdam Transgender Film Festival here at the Bali. And through couch surfing, I've arranged a place to stay with a lovely lesbian couple who called me Selma for the first time. <coughs> And they help me with my makeup, but otherwise I keep my look simple and androgynous. In the bathroom, here, I change my outfit, the baggy jeans, into the black dress. The opening film is about an American trans woman, Vicky Marlene, who is still performing at the age of 75. Forever it's gonna start tonight, was the name of the film. For the first time since that evening in New York, I'm in a space surrounded by trans people. And a few, a few years later, I moved myself to Amsterdam. And of course, well, uh, is there another story to tell? Is it another storyline? It's Amsterdam, right? The open and tolerant place we all think it is. And to be honest, it's a beautiful story, right? A shy Belgian boy moves to the big city to become the woman she always was. Jonathan Ames made an anthology, a collection of life stories of iconic trans women like Lily Elbe, Christine Jorgensen, Jan Morris, Caroline Cassie, and Jennifer Boylan. And although these are the life stories of individuals from very different eras with very diff diverse backgrounds, all these stories exhibit remarkable similarities in form and structure. The compiler recognizes in these memoirs the classic literary form of the coming-of-age novel. As the stories consistently follow the same pattern, we feel uncomfortable with assigned gender role from a young age and sensing that as a mistake that has been made. The environment attempts to change us and teaches us to suppress our feelings. But eventually, we leave our, our little village or the region and move to the big city where we can dress freely until the expression goes beyond the masquerade and we take the next step. When I discovered the writing of Edouard Louis, Didier Ribon and Annie Ernaud, all cis French writers, I was really surprised by all these similarities. Well, for example, a little extract. I listened, she spoke and I listened. And suddenly I thought, I'd like to be just like her. I want to be her. I 
envied her. She fascinated me. And the next moment, my feelings turned into a mixture of jealousy and anger. Why did she make it? I no longer wanted to listen to her. Please let her shut up. And then my emotions shifted once more. And I realized that I had never admired someone so deeply. Okay, these are the words of Edouard Louis, but I turn it a little bit, describing his initial meeting with Didier Ribon in his book, Changer Méthode. And I just transitioned the text in terms of gender. Well, sometimes it's just that easy. Um, and Edouard Louis, he met his hero in Amiens, the city where he moved to, to escape the poverty, the discrimination, the violence in his working class hometown. And he left behind his old name, Eddie, and picked a fancy new name, Edouard. He's really focused on getting rid of anything from his past. And he wants to be a completely different person and everything he does is about that. For me, it describes perfectly my first encounter with Tori Peters through the, her beloved book, The Transition Baby. I want to be you. I envy you. <laughs> I know you. And I love you. So I got my copy of The Transition Baby from my amazing publisher. She's sick at home, Marcella. Thank you once again for giving me the book. I suppose she believed it would assist me in writing my own story. However, it didn't. <laughs> I ceased writing for almost six months. <laughs> what else could I do? The book was written. And this book seemed exceptionally comprehensive, and do I even need to mention, excellently written. What hit me the most, she wrote it as a trans woman for trans women. And in the spirit of Toni Morrison, like you just explained. And that was such a relieving, a revealing, <laughs> because I couldn't stop explaining myself on a daily basis, but also in the writing itself. So through Tori, I found a strong connection with another audience, with my fellow people. And you found this connection with divorced cis women, as you mentioned as well, who, like trans women, have to rebuild their lives at a certain point. The more particular the story, the easier, is, the easier you find connections beyond gender, beyond sexuality, race, and class. Like I find myself with the Frenchies, Edouard, Didier, Annie, but also with Dutch writers like Neske Beksen, Sinan Chankaya. And the success of the transition baby is so well deserved and a sign of hope. Hope, right? That's all we have. We're all humans after all. And I'm so proud, I'm so proud to see the book it hits the shards, you have nominations, awards, and that's empowering, very, very much empowering, Tori. And you are my Tony. Oh yeah. <laughs> now I can see the abundance. There is no shortage, as I felt like two years ago. I'm surrounded by so many fantastic trans writers myself, even in this city. And yes, I'm gonna give their names, like Valentin, who's here, and another Valentin, and Tammy, and Marte, Hannah, Jasper, Stef, Sem, Noor, Thomas, Maxim, Alex, Tim, Carly, Simon, Alejandra, Toby, Lucas, and Alara, of course, and so many I forgot, and I'm so, so sorry. But I started with an I, and I end with a we. So happy to be here with you 12 years later. Thank you. So how do you respond to this? <laughs> uh, there's so much, but you know, I actually, I guess I have two things I want to say. I'm like blushing a little. Um, I'm moved also. 
Uh, sorry, I moved. Um, Take a minute. Don't worry. Uh, it's beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sometimes it helps. Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, I want to say two things. One is that uh, kind of a little story that when I was, uh, when I first um, was trying to write, when I was in that top side scene, I, I showed up at this reading and I read, I read something that I had written like uh, kind of alone. It was about shame and it was just really about myself. And I read it in front of, I had never before read in front of a room full of trans women. And it was a piece about being ashamed to be a trans woman. And I read it in front of this room and I, um, I completely bombed. Like it's one of the few times in my life that, that I really, well maybe I don't wanna be like, but the only times in my life I bombed. <laughs> but I really bombed that day. And it was because I was writing about my own shame and everyone in the room understood that I was actually talking about them, but I had never even considered them, that I was just so stuck in my own shame. And so they were insulted, actually. It was an insult, the way, what I had written. And uh, I was shocked. You know, I had never, I, I, I didn't really know what to do. And so I, I went to like the after party afterwards and I was really embarrassed. And, um, and then I went, um, I went out with the publisher of the Topside Press, and he was like, you know what, you should come to this like little writing workshop that we're doing. And uh, in the writer's workshop, he, he said, you should write two things. Um, you should write a piece, and the on only two things should be in it. And I don't know if you, if you have the, have heard of the Bechdel test here about, you know, uh, a movie, like, are there two women who talk to each other in a movie about something other than a man? You know, in so many movies, fail this Bechtel test? Well, he was like, there's a topside test. And it's the question is, are there two trans people who talk to each other in your story about something other than transition? And I realized, oops, <laughs> no, nothing I wrote passes the topside test. And I think about, you know, the, what you just read, and I thought about the moment that, that felt powerful to me is, is the moment when you're in, in front of a mirror, you're just in a club, and other people welcome you, and other people you know, compliment you. And it's not necessarily about transition, it's just about welcoming strangers. And I think that like, that's actually, you know, culture, one person is not a culture. One person is just somebody thinking. Like a culture is like between people. And so that little writing exercise that Tom had us do was, a, was an exercise in creating tr trans culture. Because uh, multiple people are necessary to create culture. So I want to just point first to that moment in what you just read and, and say, you know, that, that moved me. And, and I think that's one small reason why. And then the second thing I want to talk about is the idea of that there, there can only be one. You know, that that's against culture, first of all, if there's only one. And one of the hardest things about this book is that I was sort of made to represent you know, that like this is the book that is gonna tell all trans stories. And no matter, you know, I tried very hard to sort of point to other people and, and, and still at, at some point it felt futile. And the thing is like, I desperately need other people to write stories. And I need them to, to I need your story out there, I need all the writers that are out there because I'm so sick of representing <laughs> you on know, your own. On my own. Yeah. Like, I can't do that. Like, so it's like, you know, the more other people who tell their stories, the more I can tell a joke that's just me, that's funny to like only me, that's like my little thing, and that, it, and that no one will be like, well, that's not my situation. And it's like, yeah, I know it's not your situation. <laughs> and, and you should go read one of these other 50 books, you know? And so I need more books written. And the, 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 what I, th when, you know, when I was younger and stuff, you know, you think that you want to write the book that is like held up that way, but I've actually found it's incredibly op oppressive to be uh, held up as that book and, and it, it makes me lonely and it is um, the opposite of where I, where I started and, and where I hope to end, which is amongst, on a shelf or hopefully a library uh, of, of other books rather than 
you know, yeah, it's mine. such a large responsibility yeah. to to bear on your own. And, and also, like the thing is, like I want to have like those feelings that you talked about. I want like envy. I want competitiveness. I want the things that like writers are petty, right? And it's <laughs> like I need the chance to be petty too. You know, <laughs> um, that's what makes really great writing a lot yeah. of the times. Yeah. So, Selm, how's your book uh, going? Oh wow! Well, like pushing uh, some extra pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I started writing after all, so I'm, I'm, I'm back in the process. Back on track. Back on track, but it was, yes, so inspirational, finally. And I, I, I threw half of the book away, but that, I think that was a good thing to do, like the explanation part, Yeah. so to say. Yeah. And of course, well, it's, it's out of fic fiction more, um, and it's for me, really hard to bring the elephant in the room or to mention the elephant in the room to, to catch this time, this, 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 well, what's happening in the news, what's happening in the US when it comes to uh, legislation, anti-trans movements, also in Holland for the moment. So it's, I find it really hard to grab. And do you also feel that responsibility that Tori is talking about. Well, I feel surrounded by all those beautiful people uh, after the book. So that was last year. I uh, reached out to most of those people mentioned, and we started like a group ourselves. We even have a WhatsApp group <laughs> to ex exchange yeah. things, like um, like on the on the um, writing level, but also on an activist level, and we have discussions about, yeah, can you be a writer, a trans writer in this age uh, without being an activist? Are you allowed to just write something beautifully? Yeah. Um, so... Um, I think there was also uh, a point in time where you called yourself a lazy transgender. Hell yeah. <laughs> can you explain a little bit about that? In a while, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I took um, a detour, so to say. No detransition, but a detour. I took... It took some time, so many, many years. So 2010 is like the starting point of the transition, but it's, well, yeah, transition itself for the, the new kids is a word that they don't like to use. I feel like an oldie. I don't want to, yeah. you're my big sister, yeah. you're <laughs> two years older than me. But there's this new generation and they don't like words like um, transition or being born in the wrong body. That's also... Mm something um, that's a concept yeah. that... So the discourse is changing absolutely. all the time. Absolutely. That's yeah. interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. So when I, but when I started in, back in 2010, there was this only one narrative. Also when it came to uh, trans care, the health care, there was this one or yeah, two options, so to say. You could switch genders yeah. from one way to the other. Male to female, female to male. That, that but nothing in between. Nothing in between. Yeah. And not like... Um, uh, you, you couldn't, uh, like, like in a restaurant, uh, there was no menu. Yeah. So this, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was just one package, like the full five. 100% or 0%. Yep, you go all the yeah. way. And if you said something like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe I like the hormones. Yeah. But like the operation things like that, no, I don't want to have that. That, that was like a no-go. Then, then you were out. That was out of question. That was yeah. not possible. So when I started the world, well, it never stopped turning, right? But like in, in that era, yeah, in that period of time, 2010 until 2015, the crucial year, so to say, things started to change. Um, well, nothing new, that's clear, non-binary and gender fluidity is nothing new, nothing yeah. new there, but it had um, a moment of attention like it got in the in the mainstream all of a sudden and it helped me so much because it gave me space in that narrative all of a sudden there was another narrative um so that gave us two narratives almost and um there's this wonderful story of me slowing down in the transition although the the, the therapist she she's a very lovely woman and she was very helpful and so on, but she was a little bit pushy in the sense that she said like, maybe it's time after two years, you're on the hormones to yeah. continue. Maybe you can go to the, the next step, so to say. 
Um, and then I, I managed in a way to slow down and to catch a new wave almost. So back in 2015, there was this documentary film made about genderqueer people. And um, it, they called me to be part of this film. Actually, I didn't identify myself as a non-binary or a genderqueer person. I called myself a lazy transgender. Like I wasn't doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't do my vocal training. Like I, I didn't shave. Yeah, I shaved absolutely, totally. That's the cis passing thing we have to do. But like I started doing the, the laser treatment, but that's super painful and very expensive. So I kept raising and, and yeah. so on and so on. So I wasn't the best. Um, Example friend. of, uh, yeah. yeah. And then this lazy transness was like my new identity ident identity and space. Yeah. And yeah. the story continues and so on. But that's yeah. for the book, maybe. And um, you just said that when you read the book, you could almost uh, uh, not write for, uh, for a couple of months. Mm. Um, is there a, a character or someone that you recognized in the book or maybe an anti-hero uh, that Tori talks about? Well, I, maybe the, the ones that that I'm missing are your parents, or no, sorry, mm -hmm. the parents. Parents in general. The parents, yeah. or parents in general, yeah. There is just a small sentence, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, my parents, woof. <laughs> or the parents, we can. The parents, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's actually a section about where I wrote parents in the book, and I cut it out. Uh, not because I like was afraid of my parents, but just because um, I enjoy the idea I enjoy the act of self-creation. I enjoy the way that trans people create, create themselves. And, um, you know, uh, I'm not that into, like, authenticity, the like, authenticity of, of your experience. I'm into the idea that, like, that, yeah, being trans, you can be a lazy transgender, you can be all these different things, and that you create, you create who you are. And to some degree, you're always sort of, like, you have this, like, you know, influences or and sometimes trauma from your past. But for me, the exciting part of, of being trans is that like, I actually get to leave a lot of that behind. I mean, I literally get to change my name if I want to. I get to do the, to whatever. I can come up with a presentation. I can work hard on certain things if I want to, not hard on other things. And that I'm not answerable to my, to my parents. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not necessarily even answerable to my past which is, you know, when the mayor was talking about freedom of choice, I think it scares people that, that I would not be necessarily answerable to my past. But that to me is actually, that's freedom, you know? And like that, that, that looseness is, is, is for me a joy. So I think, I, I think I'm thematically uninterested in parents, despite the fact <laughs> this is obviously a book about motherhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we come to talk about that later yeah, on, definitely. Yeah. But what, what was interesting for, for parenthood to you, or for parents in, in the novel, the parents of the, the main characters, or what did you want to read, or what did you... Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very personal thing, of course. For me, like, I start my story with my parents. Like, I, I try to understand the... Uh, the road they took and the, the things they changed in their lives, like when it comes to religion, for example, how they broke with certain structures or traditions, traditions norms, and so on, to, to soften mm -hmm. and to feel a connection again. Yeah. And do you also understand that, that freedom of breaking with the past and creating your whole self again? I live in Amsterdam. I, <laughs> I, I left my little village. I went to Antwerp. It's not a small village, but like Edouard Louis, I took two stages, so to say. You too, I think, yeah, right? I mean, I think that's like why both books need to exist, right? Like, I think that, that, um, that I, you know, I'm interested in that story. I'm interested in how people tell that story. I also think that like, um, the, the problem is that one, is that one becomes answerable to those sort of things, you know? Yeah. And that in fact, when the books exist in a sort of intertextual way, well, the absence in mind can point to the presence in another book. You know, this is true, not just with parents, it's true with, with race. You know, the, the book, the book basically I did, um, there's three characters, 
and just in terms of pure writing technique, I go into the heads of the two trans women. I don't go into the heads of the Chinese American woman, cis woman. And the thing is, I started writing that way. I started going into the head of all three characters. And then at some point I was like, actually books by Chinese American pregnant women uh, exist. And there's no reason why my book has to re recreate their stories. If you want that story, yeah. my book is like, I consider my book like a finger pointing exterior to it and that you can just look down the shelf and read those books. Um, instead, of, instead of trying to basically recreate work that, that is done better by other people. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I prefer to think of books as sort of like existing in a tapestry that way, where like if something is missing, it just means you have an opportunity to read more. Yeah, perfect. I will uh, call our uh, our last speaker uh, to the stage. Um, that is uh, Alara Adilo. Uh, she is a Dutch poet uh, from Somali descent. Um, she wrote a, a really great debut. Uh, poetry book. It's called Myths and Traffic Lights. Um, she won uh, two prizes for it, actually, the Coding Prize and the Budding Prize. And she will read for us the poem, Water. Please give her a warm welcome. I know no speck so troublesome um, as the self, uh, George Eliot Middlemarch, um, Beach. The tide turns while I try to relax in the sand. Where does the water end and where do my ties begin? My children and I stare at the sails, the parasols and the fish and chip stand. Gulls drag my experiences through the shade. The sky is narrow and dry, I close my eyes, listen to the breeze and the lashing of the waves. For a few moments I escape this body and flow past the white spume with a flock of girls. Mother's voice murmurs in the sea, or is it my soul that I hear? Some say the sea is tree beauty. All I see is wounds and running sores. Mer, Bahari, Lar, Si, Mer, Okun. There's no difference between the aggression of an abstract concept and a material reality. Sea of absolute symbols created by the chaos of sunlight. Her freedom is her shapelessness. She is always at once in and outside herself. Images she gargled up from her death shatter on the coast. Language lays layers of reality on every water body. I wanted a heart of sound instead of this heart full of blood. I am filled with the cries of what has pursued me since I was a young girl. At the time, I thought what pursued me was benevolent. But as I grew older, I began to doubt that. We licked our lollipops, we stuck our tongues out. See, it has changed color, we boasted. While we feasted on the lollipops, the transformation was a real delight. My children are crouching on my mother's gravestone. They ask grandmother, who is going to pay the bills? I tug at her wrist and point out, bills are not for the dead. Don't ask grandma about that. Let her rest under the roots of the lavender, far from the razor sharp light. Come, water the lavender and rake the leaves of my grave. <laughs> you. Thank you, and welcome. Um, can you tell me a little bit about when you wrote this poem? Um, well, I think it was maybe two years ago. Um, I lived in Amsterdam, Amsterdam West, and then I think um, large parts of the poem came, came to me like quite quickly, because I really remember just like hearing this voice of 
this woman and I was really intrigued that it was also born with, 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 like with children. And so it was, I think, also one of the poems that, that, that actually uh, gave me a structure for the book. And so it may help me more step outside of myself and less telling my own story, but telling a story of another person, which, yeah. which was really like awesome because I wrote a lot of like, yeah, poetry. I do write a lot of in the eye, but it was really like this embodiment of this person that, um, yeah, that her voice and this, I just hear her voice and, um, yeah, so like a year ago, two years ago. Two, two years, years ago, ago. yeah. Two years ago. The title of one of your poems is uh, Grant Me a Language in Which I Can Enter Into Genderless Relationships with the World. How did you find the language to, to write this book, to write all your poems about? Um, I don't, I think like um, the queer theory did help me a lot. Um, I, um, and I think also like I was really a lot into language poetry. So um, definitely the relationship to language in the self and language in expression and trying to contain the world within uh, language. Um, that really helped give me a framework also to think about uh, gender. And I think a lot of gender theory also dialogues with language or um, the poetry that I was interested in and queer theory that I was interested in really came together in a way. Um, and I also read a lot of story about myth and folk, folk tale and folk stories so about imagination and myth making, um, which I was really intrigued by. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, can you tell me something about what the, the book of Tori Peters means to you? Oh, wow, it means so much. <laughs> like, yeah, you asked me that question like before and yeah. um, there's so much in the book. Um, I think for me, one of the things it was that um, like when, like maybe may also like searching for yourself, but maybe not finding yourself directly but that that being a good thing as well like just that the person that you are may become like as a surprise to you or and navigating through that um, and navigating through the choices to make about selfhood and also the choices that you don't have or something which is quite like a complicated um, interaction between the two I think um, when we talk about autonomy and when we talk about a story about transition and saying, okay, we're going to choose this. One side's like, okay, I'm going to become who you are in your own gender expressions and express yourself as you want the freedom to express it. But the other way there is also, it seems like, okay, but I haven't chosen to be, oh, like, for me as a transgender, but I haven't chosen to be a transgender person or something. Like, it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to, you know, and the, the conflicts between the two. Yeah. Or the friction, which is which, yes, quite. I mean, it's, it's that's interesting to hear, you know, because the question of whether you chose to be trans, um, you know, I think it's like one of these like ontological questions that can't ever be answered. And for me, like that was why I ch chose detransition to write about rather than transition, is that I think. You know, that story of, of transition is super overdetermined, where people are like, this is the story of you, you feel a way, and then you transition, and then you blah, blah, blah. But we actually don't have a really great story for detransition, you know? And so, in a way, for me, detransition felt freer. It felt less baggage, and it felt like it had those things that you're talking about, except it's like, if you choose to detransition, we don't actually say, like, well, that's who you really are. You know, you're, a you're just truly a detransitioner. You're a quitter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's not, that's not actually how we talk about detransition. And so it was an opportunity to actually like parse those things without a lot of the baggage of the past. And I'm still actually, you know, as interested in, in detransition as I am in transition. You know, I, I'm interested in the way that like the myths around detransition get piled on by people who aren't trans. I'm interested in taking back detransition and I'm also interested in the way that like detransition to me feels like in some ways a truer story than transition. In that like transition, you have that story like what you were talking about, that they give you one option, here's how you transition. 
There's no story for detransition, and so you get to pick it. Mm -hmm. And the idea that like there's a, the idea that even we shouldn't detransition, whoa, <laughs> look at that. There was a microphone here this whole time. Uh, you know, the idea that we shouldn't detransition like upsets me because the idea that like there's like one perfect gender over there and that your job is to like, okay, I'm gonna transition and I'm gonna hit that gender right on the first try. Like that's not real for trans people. It's also definitely not real for cis people, right? Like every cis person I know was like, I don't know, a goth in high school and then like a preppy and then like a, a, you know, whatever. Like everybody goes through these changes. And the idea that like there's some line of demarcation that is like, you, well, if you cross this line, you better know forever is fantasy to me um, and also very interesting fantasy for me, um, which is sometimes hard to talk about in, in transition. So. Wow. Uh, so, like, that's a, that's an interesting. And also, like, I I think like I was really indeed I, I, the the first thing came to me like it seems like a much more controversial um, subject or team to have in a book because it, it, I think there we did talk about like transphobia, but I think there are also like a lot of narratives about transitioning and it's maybe about trans women or trans men as well, but that. I was when I was one thing I was confronted by by family members or like my uncle who said it was okay it's going to be like a phase so this whole thing about making a choice and making the right choice which I think there's a whole a lot of conversation about okay um, giving hormones to young people and that whole risk so um, that it's that it's really. Um, it, 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 instead of narrowing down transition and stories about uh, maybe gender travels or gender journeys, it really opens it up. So, it, it, and that's the whole thing about it's okay. Like it's yeah. it's not a problem that you want to try out or so when you are searching for yourself and to let that search be free without a lot of yeah condemnation and with a lot of like okay the risk involved and the dangers and it always seems like there's so much to lose setting out on a gender journey and it's cruel like what your uncle yeah. said to you i think is sorry i cut in but i think it's cruel like the idea like it's, okay it's just a phase and then to me i'm like i'm like so what if it's a phase number one but number two what is what is you no not to pick on your uncle but what is your uncle saying if it is just a phase, that once you take hormones, then you're a monster, that you've ruined your body forever, that you can be like unlovable, all that stuff is like actually built into the sort of like it's just a phase kind of language. Yeah. It's, it is a way to basically say that like, unless you hit the perf mark perfectly, you are a freak forever. Yeah. And I hear that every time somebody says that to me, says not to me, but you know, just says it on television. Uh, you know, it's just a phase, it's just like, and the thing is like, I know detransition people, I know people who have done all sorts of different ways, and those people are like beautiful people living really great lives in context of like real deep freedom. Um, and so I get, I'm sorry, like you can tell that like I'm mad at your uncle right now. Like I'm just like, uh, I'm just like, there's actually a tons of cruelty behind those kinds of statements. That, yeah, but that, but I, the, that like that was so precise what you're saying about like exploring gender. You're immediately like that monster thing or that that thing that doesn't fit in as soon as it. So like gender constraints are so tight and moving out of it, it's like completely, which is which is quite strange actually. Like we're under such a democratic society and there's, you know, like, we got, like, sexual revolution, and, but as soon as you're, like, okay, I want to just experience taking hormones, or, and, yeah, that's, that, that is definitely, like, a, a very peculiar thing. Um, yeah, and, sorry, I could uh, just go on for this uh, for a while, if yeah. you have a question, I'll, <laughs> I'll see the mic to you. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, because were you scared when writing about detransition that the wrong people would make a sort of, ah, you see, story about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that people do that. And I think that, like, the, the thing is, like, you can't write from that defensive place. You can't write from, like, oh, what if they... And it happened to me. You know, people attacked me and, and when I wrote this book. And it made me scared to write anything else because I'll write a line and I'll say, oh, 
Like, you know, there was a women's prize in, 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 in the UK, and people wrote all this ugly stuff about me, and then I would write a line, and I'd be like, oh my god, if, if I say this line, I can't imagine the, like, fucked up shit that is going to be written about this particular line. Yeah, because and, you were nominated for the, the women's prize, and then people got mad. Yeah, and there were, like, was in the yeah. papers and all this stuff, and, and, you know, it was a very ugly experience for me at first, Um, but I think that actually, like, you know, going through that, uh, you, it made me feel like I actually, I can't write from a defensive place. And that, again, like, not to, to sort of broaden it out away from trans stuff, I actually think this is a, a problem for many different writers not writing from a, a defensive place. Um, you know, like, I'm thinking about what you just said about, about tr trans stuff and... Um, the way that, like, if you do things other, you become a monster. And I see, like, I see that in all, and the way that that makes you kind of unfree, and I see that, like, in all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different contexts in this moment. And I think that, like, you know, actually what I want is I want, uh, you know, this is me personally, like, I kind of want terrifying texts. I want texts that, like, uh, I don't know what to do with, and that like maybe are, are monster texts, and I want them, um, I want them for, like, not just for political reasons. Like I like deeply want them for myself to like figure things out. Like when you mentioned like the woman prize and all the critique you had for it, and we also talked about like detransitioning and that it's okay, okay, like finding that the transition is perhaps like does not not fit or is not the right journey, but do you ever also feel like, is there any, any way, in, at any point, like a dialogue or when a conflict, when it comes at one side, when we talk about, um, I think it is, you being nominated for one prize, but I think in the Netherlands we also had like a beauty model um, that won the prize, was a trans woman, and there was also a lot of critique, and I think um, a lot of um, maybe, like maybe like the medical transitioning and with psychology and that there's there's been a very hard fight and that there's a lot of theory being created about transgender women to make to make sure as to you yeah. know to be to say like a transgender woman is a woman so not that there um should be that person doesn't fit like with the woman prize, right? Like so, okay, it is unfair or it is not. It is discriminating to say you shouldn't win the woman prize and discriminating for that model not to win the on the one side and then the other side we got like the three D transition theory and there's like a whole yeah. spectrum between it. Which do you, do you ever feel like? Well, I that, think some that of this problem I, in, some in, of this is has to do with history and in the you know, in the history between. Uh, ways that people are trans in Europe and the ways that people are trans in the United States, in that in Europe, for a long time, you could have, because healthcare is covered, you could have your, your surgeries covered. And so you had doctors who were really involved in the process. You had a sort of way of doing things that was really, if you did it right, you could actually have a free surgery. There was never free surgery in the United States. You always had to pay yeah. for it. And so, as a result, trans women, I can think around like 2006, for instance, there, there was early organizing around access to healthcare. And the access to healthcare wasn't, can I get a doctor to do stuff? It was, it was literally like, like there was a place in, in, in Seattle, and it was called the Orky Barn. And if people don't know what an Orky is, it's castration. And so a barn and Orky, you can put together what happens in the barn. You know, it was, it was not, it was, there was a nurse who was in an unlicensed way wow. giving trans women orchiectomies. There's a friend, and speaking of detransition, there's someone I know, she had uh, saline breast implants and she wanted to detransition. And there's this really famous uh, moment that, amongst my friends where her friend popped her saline breast implants with a veterinary needle. Oh. It was really hardcore. It was like very punk. Um, <laughs> and, and the thing is like, if you are popping breast implants with a veterinary needle, you are ready on the monster side. You know, you're ready, you're ready there. And so I think that there's a way in which, you know, 
the ethos that's behind some of the American stuff had to do with organizing outside of these larger systems. And that I, when I run into Europeans, um, you know, mostly from the UK, that, and that created culture, right? Like if everybody's in a barn getting orkies, they're also talking about other stuff. And they're creating literature and they're talking about art. And like Sybil, who, who, who did this veterinary needle, was the person who did the art for my first book. And it was because we were building our own kind of culture around it that was already a monster culture. Whereas in the UK, for instance, when I talk to UK people, they could get their medical care covered from the start. And so they had no incentive. Well, they didn't have, they had many incentives, but there was not a sort of official incentive to gather and trade underground information. And in this way, you can, you can actually substitute a word like underground with like monster information. So like some of the first books that were trans literature in the United States were like uh, Susan Stryker's My Words to Victor Frankenstein on the Mount, which is explicitly a monster book. Like this is, these are monster stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I want the, I want, this book, it's weird because like, you know, obviously it's like a bestseller and it's like, people are like, it's sex in the city and stuff like that. But like, I also want it to be a monster book. Like I also am like, I want detransition to be ours, uh, you know? And, and, and sometimes when I wrote about detransition, I was like, right wing politicians would be like, detransition doesn't belong to you. You didn't detransition. Um, and I'm kind of like, no, I, it looms for me. It's a possibility. I want it. Um, I'm not really sure if that answers your question. Uh, no, no, no. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, please. No, I think this is a good time to also talk a little bit about uh, the internalized transphobia that's also in your book. Mm -hmm. comes up a lot. Um, why did you find it important to also address that? I mean, just because it's true, right? Like... Of course you have internalized, uh, you, of course you have shame, and of course you have uh, internalized misogyny, and like, you can't write an honest work of literature if you're pretending to be a role model, if you're pretending to be perfect, if you're pretending to be basically, that's propaganda, right? To basically be like, I'm happy all the time, and this transition was wonderful, and that's great. That's not truth, that's propaganda. Um, and I'm kind of interested in literature. Like, I mean, you, you, your piece here was about, there was shame, you know, worked through it. And, and that felt true. If you had been like, well, I went and it was great, and that was that, done. You know, that is not, I, would, I wouldn't believe you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, and other people have the right to talk about their shame. Um, and I, I claim for myself the right to talk about my own shame. How's that for you? Well, it's interesting, like the, the hate, the trans hate, that's, well, something that we got used to. No, I'm not used to it, not at all, but uh, it's something we, it's quite familiar nowadays, so to say. Well, it can't even reach the ankles of my self-hatred, right? That the, the, the inner transphobia is, is huge and it's really hard to, um, uh, well, this, this reflection um, in other people as well, fellow trans people, that's the hardest part, I, I think. It's going better now. I, I, feel, <laughs> I feel better. Um, oh, but it's, it's such a big topic, and it's a taboo topic as well, I guess. It's really hard. Um, it comes close to this, uh, well, Edouard Louis, once again, the, the inner homophobia, of course. Uh, the shame, well, shame is such a huge topic. Shame, hate, self-hate, enviness is also something in the trans community, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe also like uh, what I really noticed a lot, like the, the remarkability of a certain thinking that you can like internalize. Like when I think back about my thoughts about my transition when I was younger, it's like, this is so weird how, it is like it's almost like a, a sub-reality uh, that you go through, that you really gotta break free from, which yeah, it, has so many, it has so much interconnectivity, you know, when we are, I think almost like popular culture, it's in so many ways misogynistic and like homophobic, or, and like it's everywhere all the time, and, 
I think it's just ironic that for a very long time I was very a lot of, like ashamed about transitioning, about being a trans woman, which after I transitioned and a few years later looking back on it, now I just feel ashamed about having those ideas, you know, like mm -hmm. I feel ashamed not being able to come to terms with my transness, about coming to terms with the person that I was, about rejecting myself. And um, I think also um, kind of feel, feeling like that I made such a fool of myself, trying to deny the person that I really was, you know, and that just brings up so much shame, you know, like, like this really the self-destructiveness. Um, uh, yeah, which is quite scary, and I think I really do hope that at least that will change for like the next generation, that there isn't this internalized, um, yeah, like indeed with homophobia or transphobia. And I even think like sexism as well for being a trans woman, it was also like, at least from my mother's point of view, and which I think I also internalized, it was really like this thing, oh, you're, you're a man, but now you're acting like a woman, which is much lesser or something. So this really kind of defeat. And I was really interested, I think, also um, in like, there's a lot of theories about feminization of the black uh, men, you know, in like hip hop culture, but there were also definitely like scholars, academics, who had a lot of theory about that even the government would have been like, okay, we've got to feminize the black men and break family structures. And um, yeah, so really like this thing, like, you got this, like a black man, and it's like a degradation or a huge loss, a spiritual loss or whatever. Sometimes um, it does have uh, religious connotations. It's like completely, you're dealing with concepts which you really got to break through in so many different ways because it, I think what we also do underestimate when we're talking about transphobia or homophobia, it is not complete ignorance, you know? We are dealing with scholars like academics, with university degrees or professors, like there's this huge framework built around homophobia and transphobia or which for a young person, it's very easy to fall into, right? Um, and e even though it still brings up a lot of shame and also regret and like, okay, but why wasn't I, why didn't I overcome this and why couldn't I see through this and... Um, yeah. You play with, with the monsters, right? I love the book, first of all. I do, but I found it so confronting the way you talk about authenticity and about realness, things like that. Do you hear that more often, like from trans, fellow trans people? And it, it, we had this, had this conversation about like uh, comments about the poetry book and I, th I think because it's like poetry and like it's Dutch poetry as well, <laughs> so it's like really quiet uh, book. Um, <laughs> like I was worried about some things that I was like, I did had like, also that I felt I was controversial. I, I was also afraid I was gonna be canceled by like the queer community because of my poetry book, which, which is weird. But you know, because obviously, yeah, I was, I did like, yeah, I suppose I really did, came in contact with people and really got in a time that was, that was so much like negativity against me and, and everything, like not just against me, but just negativity everywhere around me. And I didn't feel, it didn't feel fair to like silence that and ignore that like it wasn't in the world. Um, yeah. I want to address one more theme before we also open up to the audience to see if there are any questions. Uh, because a big part of your, your book is also about parenthood, about motherhood, about fatherhood, about the difficulties of those concepts. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you explored these um, archetypes or? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the thing is that I was telling you this at lunch. You know, I wrote this book when I was, um, started when I was 34, I'm 42 right now. And um, of course, I was, looking I was looking around myself uh, for basically, you know, I was on the far side of transition uh, the, a lot of the transition qu questions were settled, and the thing that I wanted to know was like, all right, you did the transition. How do you actually live now? Like, what does it mean to live for the next, 
hopefully de you know, many decades of my life. And I looked around to the older generation and the situation for older trans women was so much more difficult than what I have. You know, the horizon for me is, is so much further. Um, you know, I wasn't looking like I had a couple weeks. I was looking ahead year, months, maybe years. And so I asked the older trans women like, well, how do you live a whole life? And they're like, I don't know. It's, you know, we did it this way, but that's not your situation. And, um, you know, so then the obvious people to look to uh, were cis women. How do they live their life when they're in their th 30s? And I looked around to all the cis women and they were all having babies. <laughs> so uh, I was like, well, me too. <laughs> um, uh, so then I was like, well, what would it mean to be a trans mother? You know, what is, what would motherhood mean for me? What do I, do I, do I want? And in some ways, I, I think of fiction as, as a test case where you get to write a story, you get to have these characters, you get to wind them up and then set, set them out and try and have them figure out things that you need to figure out in your own life. So, you know, for this book, I kind of set them up and I was like, do I want to be a mother? Like, I'll have these characters who are, be super messy and run into every problem that I might run into, you know, from everything from like, where does the baby come from, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to like, in what ways is there discrimination? In what ways is there, um, in what ways does this resonate with like larger community stuff? And in the end, I, uh, you know, a lot of people thought I was like baby crazy for writing this. And at the end of it, I like, uh, finished it and I was like, I don't think I want to have kids. <laughs> and um, I, exactly at that moment, I met my um, my partner, Chris, my wife, who had a, uh, a nine-year-old and um, and uh, was actually living with a, a man at the time. Sorry to share that, Chris. <laughs> um, and so I was like, wow, this is, I just wrote an entire book to prepare for this moment. Um, <laughs> and now I'm a stepmom. And it's, it's wonderful. Um, so I think that actually that's what, you know, a lot of fiction can do that. So um, I, wouldn't write, I wouldn't write about family and motherhood now because I feel like that was a, you know, it turns out that the stages of a, of a trans woman's life and the things that confront a trans woman are exactly the same as, you know, pretty much those that, that confront cis women. So in your 30s, you may think about yeah. motherhood. In your 40s, you may think about other questions. And I'm more on like the other questions kind of thing now that, that, that I think there's actually nothing particularly um, uh, unusual or, or even necessarily of having a, a wild interest in motherhood and children in order to write a book about it when you're in your 30s because that's simply um, kind of the, the world around you. Yeah. And I, even though I'm trans, I also exist in the world. <laughs> yeah. I think Reese calls it the sex in the city problem yeah. in her book. Yeah. yeah, which was, you know, that tongue in cheek version of, yeah. of you know, that's a very Reese language for what I just said, yeah. basically. Yeah. Reese would never deign to speak the way I did. Uh, she would just say, here's a reference to a television show that <laughs> says the same thing. What do you think about the, the concepts of motherhood, about fatherhood, about parenthood? Um, yeah, before you start hormone replacement therapy, you get the, the question like, do you want to preserve? Right? Some things. That's a good question, yes. right? Yeah. And I said yes, because I was in a long-term relationship by that time. Um, finally, we broke up. I had my divorce, kind of. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and there was this uh, period of time, 10 years, um, that it's preserved or that it's conserved um, in a fridge in Ghent, far, far away. Um, and it's when I... It's exact location. Yeah, it's a good place. It's, I, well, I, I haven't been there for a while, so I hope, it's still, I hope it's still there. I never checked, actually. But, well, anyway, so before the, the treatment, I... Um, gave, and then um, I signed this contract that it was for 10 years. It has to do with legislation. Um, it's not that um, it's not good for longer time of uh, well, but 10 years that's like the the max normally. Yeah, yeah. and I was 28 back then, 
And then I thought, like, well, this makes sense, right? Any cis uh, woman around 38, 40, something, well, that's the frame, the time frame. And if you don't know it by then, said my 28-year self to my later self, then it's over, then it's over, yeah. So when I was like 29, 30, then I went to Amsterdam and the whole story continues. Then I was 35 and I started to date as if I was like a cis woman with this time pressure. I really wanted to have kids, but I knew that I had like, well, 35, three years left. So I put so much pressure on certain relationships. Well, and that's not a good thing to do, right? <laughs> Talking about children at a first date, Tinder date. <laughs> you know the drill, right? That's, that's not something that's really It's uh, not helpful. recommended, I think. No, it's not yeah. recommended. But that silly me, of course. Well, this contract had the, the, the little letters, a, letter, a little uh, line. The side notes. The side notes. Yeah. And apparently it was after 10 years you could ask easily for... Um, Another. Another year. So this is what I'm doing now. So every year again, in, in June, I have to write this beautiful letter <laughs> to the doctor in Ghent and tell him about my situation and how life is going. And I, I didn't, well, it didn't work out. I wrote him three years ago. And last year I said like, yes, I'm, I'm having this girl. I found a girl in Groningen. Um, but we just moved in, you know, so we didn't, so hope to see you next year, and then... <laughs> so the story continues, so the motherhood is still in the fridge, it's still optional, I don't it's know. It's still there. And I'm, yeah. I'm 40 now, so maybe, I don't know. You still have some time, I, I still have some time. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, still, is it uh, the same doctor that you have to write to every year? Yep. Okay. <laughs> It's a beautiful bond you're creating. It's a book itself, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. How's this for you, Alara? I had a question. I'd, I'd also got that same question as well. But uh, um, I definitely said no. And they were really like, are you sure? Are you sure? You can't know. You can't know how you're going to feel like in five years. And I'm like, I'm yeah. sure. Like, I don't want any children. And I have enough. Yeah. And I'm glad I don't have to write a letter every year because like I don't I don't think I could do it. I'm definitely like like you just said like you're like a lazy trans person, but I'm lazy enough not to write that letter. Like, be like <laughs> no. You know yourself very well. Yeah. yeah that's it. Yeah. And I, yeah. I would just say as an American, that sounds like exactly when I say like we just did whatever in a barn. <laughs> that that sounds preferable, like in some ways that like we, I, I don't know, like I this is this is actually very like kind of horrific. That's funny story certainly, but it's like horrific that actually that this has to happen this way. Like it's a it seems like a series of small insults uh, to me, um, which I I mean I love the story, but but there's a way in which like it's like this is actually. This kind of thing is the problem for me with trans healthcare. That it's 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 actually it's incredibly infantilizing. Uh, it, we're not in control of it, mm. and that I'd rather have, I'd rather just be figuring it out, you know, ordering hormones from Mexico, than have to basically go through what sounds to me like an indignity about uh, what is uh, one of the most fundamental things that humans can do, which is whether to raise children. Yeah. So. Um, Sorry to criticize the way it's done. Oh, no. But no, no, no. It's like but even in the contract was written that in case I wanted to use it with my partner, we had to go to another psychologist first. Oh, wow. yeah. Talk about it and to, to, to say, yes, we are sure we want to raise a child. They, 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 it's a, it's that, that's over. It's a humiliation. It's a humiliation. Abs you know, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to end on that. No, 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 no. It was just, <clears throat> yeah. Can be hard. Yeah. Every time. Yeah, it was even like like this that um, well, I lived in Antwerp, Antwerp back then, and um, so I thought it makes more sense that I do the uh, preservation, the the conservation in Antwerp instead of Ghent. But they have the gender clinic, so they know what to do. They know the procedures and so on. Um, so I tried to go to the hospital in Antwerp and I told them my story, like I'm a trans person and I'm in Ghent and I can do it over there, but you know, like this is like two kilometers, 
52 kilometers away from my home, so... Might be more easy. Might be yeah. more easy. I was on the phone, so I had this, this woman and she said like, oh, okay, uh, that's interesting. Well, I have to discuss this with my staff. I'll call you back. So I was waiting for a couple of days and nothing happened, so I called myself. And then she said like, no, this is not something we can do, right? Because you're, you're well, from twee wolletjes eten, how would you translate this? Yeah, uh, you're trying to get the both. Have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. So that, well, and I wanted to say something, but then she hung up. She hung up. I mean, it's, it's very, the th I guess this actually ends with like the theme of the talk, answer down the most queer city in the world, you know, and it's like, it's like, it's, uh, coming to Europe for me is like very, very interesting because all of this stuff is very different than the United States. And in some ways, like, it, it feels really good for me to be here. When I'm in the, something has changed for me in the United States in the last couple of years, which is that when I wrote this book in 2016, most people didn't know about trans stuff, like the audiences, which meant that I got to actually like kind of talk as, as an artist. You know, people would be like, this is how it is. And people would be like, that's cool. Um, whereas now it's in the news all the time in the United States, it's a political talking point. And so what I feel when I speak to audiences is that I'm, and they're all gonna go vote, right? They're gonna go vote for different politicians and those politicians are gonna make decisions that are based you know, whether or not I can get hormones, whether my friends can, whether we can use bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so essentially what, what this has done is it has converted all audiences into juries that I, instead of, instead of like actually speaking to be like, hey, I'm an artist, here's like a thing. I'm like essentially testifying in like these like, you know, uh, subtextual ways. And it's very alienating and I pretty much don't like doing public events. And, and then I really like coming here. And so it feels very free in that sense. But then also there is a history of, of the way that things get medicalized, the ways that, that this stuff gets involved. And so I hear a story like that and it makes me want to go back to the United States where I'm like, well, okay, sure. Uh, I have to watch some bullshit on the television. But for the most part, if I have the money, I can get what I want. Yeah. Um, it's very American, obviously. Um, uh, but there's, you know, which, yeah. which is really freer. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like a, almost a completely different uh, uh, con concept of freedom. Yeah. Um, well, but this is Americanized in a way. In Amsterdam, for example, I, I did my research. I went to doctors, for example, for breast augmentation. And I did it for the book as a anthropologist or whatever, but also for myself, of course, but it helped me to keep the, a certain distance. And there I found out that, um, indeed, as long as you have money, they don't care. Are you trans? Are you whatever? I went to this one doctor and he, uh, he specialized in uh, transferring fat. So he takes fat mostly from the, the stomach and, or, or the tummy, and then he replaces it. Um, and I was so interested that he started to show me pictures, like people, they put it in the hands, they put it in the ankles, like anywhere. Well, anywhere you want, yeah. And he doesn't care. Yeah, but and that's in Amsterdam as well. I think the one thing that's like, you know, the whole thing like, I think the Netherlands is also very much like if you got money, you can get where you want. But I think the whole thing with transition and even broader cosmetic surgery that the problem, I think it's not that it's not always that one on one deal like, OK, I'm going to pay you this and I'm going to get this back. You know, there's always like this. There's always this incongruity or possible a possibility of it, at least like with breast implants or any kind of type of surgery that even if you do like spend the money, you, you might not get the results that you want or might things go wrong. And because there are a lot of many different surgeons and there are many things that can go with the procedure. So I think like with the whole free market thing that a lot of products you can buy, you exactly know what you get and there's no pro anything unproblematic about it. I think like surg uh, surgery and also 
having to do with maybe transgender surgery, like in between going uh, to like perhaps Thailand or Brazil or Turkey as a famous place or doing it in Belgium or the Netherlands and finding a surgeon, you know, it, it's, it is still very problematic even if you save up the money and be like, okay, I've, you know, and how much are you going to spend? And which also makes it quite the strange thing, right? Like, okay, there's a whole spectrum of how much money you can spend, and then there's all these places you can go. Nobody really gives you full security about being the best place. Um, so you have a lot of um, uncertainty with this uh, purchase. Um, I think uh, I will look at the audience to see if there are any questions or remarks or <laughs> things that you might want to say or share. <laughs> it's very quiet. Everything's clear, no questions. <laughs> no questions left to ask. Okay. Well, I think we should continue this conversation, perhaps at the bar, uh, together with all of you. Oh, there is one. That's great. Wait a moment for the microphone to come to you. Hi, thank you all for uh, for your uh, talks. Uh, I had a question um, on uh, actually what Tori was just saying on how the subject in the U.S., but I think it's coming over to Europe as well, has been has become more politicized. Eh? It's it's has become a ideological discussion for politicians or for for people all over the spectrum instead of. Um, well, instead of out of empathy or, or tolerance, as the mayor just put it at the beginning of, of her speech. So uh, sometimes I find myself getting into that struggle when, whether it's friends or acquaintances or people talking about that, it, it becomes this ideological uh, argument instead of uh, a human uh, approach to your fellow human beings. Um, I was thinking out of your experiences for all three of you, how you, how you deal with that in your daily lives, uh, maybe also some easy party tricks to, <laughs> to kind of, uh, yeah, get it out of the political, uh, ideological spectrum and to the, to the hum humane element. Oh, both people are looking at me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I think, you know, for me, a lot of it's about picking your ground. You know, like, I, I'm very, very interested in empathy and literature, you know, and, and, and it's why I do things like dedicate the book to divorce this woman. I'm, I'm not a sort of like stay in your lane kind of only write about stuff. I want people to have conversations, I want people to see themselves in each other in literature. I don't necessarily want to do that when I'm on the train with a stranger. I don't want to do it when I'm watching television. Uh, and I actually think that, like, for me, a lot of it is like the premise of the question, right? The, the premise of the question is someone is like, well, I don't think you should have the right to have hormones. And I'm like, well, who are you? You know, who, who are you? What, what does it matter to you? And why do you think that I care what you think and that I have to have this debate with you? You know, and I think that like the, the so much of the premise of the questions denies my basic humanity and my basic uh, uh, autonomy, my basic rights to do with with my life and my body what I want, and I I kind of refuse to have uh, an, a debate on unequal grounds where one one uh, party gets to choose what I do with my body, and I don't have any say about what the other party is doing with their body. In fact, we're not even debating that, and the idea that we debate it would be a huge insult to that person. Uh, that is basically like a, a fundamental inequality in the, in the grounds for the debate that causes me to not have it in the first place, to reject it. And if people want to come to me and basically be like, all right, Tori, I want to control your body, but here's the various things that I'm going to give up about my body. Oh, sure, let's talk, you know? <laughs> like, no Viagra for you. You know, it's like, uh, great, we'll have it that way. And, but until then, you know, I'm going to have this debate in literature and I'm going to have to talk about empathy in literature. Um, I, I, I think that empathy 
there was a beautiful speech that at the beginning, but I also think that empathy, while I want it to be the standard, I also don't think that you extend empathy always unconditionally in the face uh, of a fist, uh, essentially. Um, and that's, that's my, you know, I could be wrong about that. There's tons of philosophy about these questions, but that's, that's where I stand. Yeah. Great, the questions are coming. Well, I went to Brighton last summer um, because they had the Trans Pride for the 10th time. And I wanted to join, I wanted to go there because it's in the UK, and the UK, it's like turf island. They almost invented, they almost invented the, the gender critical um, movement, so to say. So my expectation was in Brighton, these people know the drill. They know, they have coping mechani mechanisms, they have IDs, they, they know how to fight or how to care for each other. Well, and it was devastating. The people I talked to, they didn't know. They, they were even more depressed. So it, it was like rock bottom for me this summer. Uh, so I came back and I totally missed the pride here. We had beautifully this queer pride this year next to the ordinary pride. But I couldn't go. I was just too much depressed in a way. And um, I planned to go to Italy to... Um, start this course, um, a body awareness um, practice, something that I, as a client, found uh, really helpful. Um, and I had this realization earlier uh, this year that it's something I could do myself, one-on-one, -on -one, for trans people. And, well, that's something that keeps me going for the moment that it's something that I like to explore. Well, body awareness or body work in general is something that's not included in a trans uh, care. The medical care is focused on the body, but we don't um, in a very medical way. So it's, it, well, uh, in, w in a certain sense, I, I feel I'm, I'm on a mission that there is something to do there. Um, and that, that's something that's something concrete in a one-on-one -on -one situation, yeah. I'll just add something to what I, what I said. I, I love that. But of the trans women I know who've been along, around a long time, most of them have realized that, like, you actually don't have to debate with transphobes. Like you, don't have, like, you don't have to spend your time doing it. You can make art. You can uh, hang out with your friends. You can do all this stuff. And that, like, when you are, like, when you're starting, it's like you have like no armor and that you develop armor and that actually like that's all just noise and it goes away and you can just like love your friends. And yeah, politics exists and, and, and that, kind of, that kind of thing is real, but like you don't have to emotionally invest in people hating you. And that's like, honestly, that's just like a life skill as much as, a, as like a, uh, a rhetorical technique. <laughs> so I, I recommend that for people. Like, don't invest in people hating you. That's clear. Yeah. I think here on the first row there was another question. Um, oh, I, okay. Um, I was actually going to ask another question, but you've already answered that. Both. <laughs> Thank you. But I had another question, which is, if all three of you could give us, like, three poets or writers that you're reading right mm. now, or you're excited about... Um, it's a lot of like great stuff coming to the Netherlands. We're trying to translate as much of it as possible to get over to the U.S., but I'm just curious who's exciting you right now? Who should we be listening to? sounds like a perfect question to end with. Let's do a little round. One after each other? Sure. Yeah? <laughs> Valentin Hogekamp. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, a Dutch poet or author, there's so many... Um, 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 okay, so one Dutch poet. Um, yes, yes, exactly. I wasn't like I wasn't sure if like it would be awkward to say her name because she's also in the crowd. Well, then, the yeah, so, of course. But I could point, so then it's going to be simpler. Perfect. Um, I'm going to mention this book. It's from 1983. 
It's by an uh, author, American author named Phyllis Rose, who was a feminist author, kind of writer. It's not talked about much, but I read it last week and it like was blew my mind. It's called Parallel Lives, and it's it's about uh, five Victorian couples. It's about the Ruskin, uh, George Eliot, uh, um, and Ruskin, George Eliot, Thomas Carlyle, uh, and uh, John Stuart Mills, and about their marriages. And what was amazing about it is that they they couldn't divorce, and as a result of not being able to divorce. They had to invent their own style of marriages, their own kind of relationships. And so some of the relationships were sexless. Some of them would be like things that we would recognize now as like, that's a cuckold relationship doing like, a th like it's really just like wild relationships. And the thing that was cool about it to me is that like, it felt like it was these, in what was supposedly the most repressive era, kind of socially, you had stories of people creating the most interesting relationships, the most wild kind of like queer things, only it was a Victorian morality. And it was so, it felt super freeing to me. It felt like, oh, like anybody can do anything in any situation. You can make what you, you can make your marriage what you want. And you don't have to like call it queer. You don't have to call it trans. You don't have to call it anything. Cause like, George Eliot lived with a man who was unmarried, who, was, who had you know, three kids with another woman who was sleeping with a guy, uh, who, and they were his kids, and that guy was in love. It was like, and it was all Victorian morality. So if you can do that, if they can do that, it's like, you can just kind of, you don't have to pull anything off a shelf. You don't have to like, oh, I'm polyamorous, I'm this, I'm that, whatever. You just do it. Uh, that was cool. That was a great book, Parallel Lives. Hmm. Another round? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's Antiboy, well, by the way. Valentin okay. Hochkamp Antiboy. Yeah. Super rough. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Second one, second round. Sinan Chankaya. It's not translated yet. It's unbelievable. Men ontelbare identiteiten. All the intersections, race, class, not gender, not translated yet. You get that book for real. Okay. Yeah. Do you have another one, or do you take a pass? I'm gonna pass because, like, I feel like you know, that's like, I, I always hate like that question because like a <laughs> hundred, like you know, yeah. so many people have come to into my mind, and then it's like, okay, I gotta say that one or the second, and then you know, yeah. so I'm gonna pass. Was Camilla Sosa uh, Camilla Sosa Viada translated? Uh, yeah. She was translated to Dutch. That was, um, the, yeah, that was good. And Las Malas was another one in Spanish for Las Malas. That's a great book by an Argentine trans woman. So I'll say that one. Uh, Perfect. It's like magical realism, but, but uh, a lot of honestly the same themes that I write about just in Argentina. So yeah, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will end it here. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Selmil Wenselaar, Alara Adilo, and Tori Peters. And of course, the mayor of Amsterdam. Thank you so much.